Good morning, Faith Fellowship. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. The Bible say, let the redeem of the Lord say so. I don't know about you, but I thank him this morning for waking me up. I thank him this morning that you allow me to speak to you today. I'm Pastor Rosalie Charlie, 5937, what I knew in the city of North Highlands, California. Oh, please come by, drop by. But also today, I have something special for you today. Those of you that had a birthday will have a birthday the month of August. We're going back to what? We're almost ready to come back home. If your birthday is in the month of August, guess what? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Happy birthday to Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to Hallelujah, God. Let's open our mouths and get ready to worship real quick. In your laptop, in your smartphone, in your tablet, just join us right now in this quick word of worship. Let me hear everybody say, I do. I do. I do. Oh, Lord. I do. Real good, real good. Let's say that again. I really do, yeah. Oh, no. I do. I worship you. Let me say, for your goodness and your glory, for your goodness and your glory, for the joy inside, for the joy inside your story. Help me say, I do, I do worship you. Help me say this, oh how excellent.
right now, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you. Do you mean it? Hey, do you mean it? Hey, do you mean it? Say it with your mouth, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you. I love you, Lord. Yes, I really do. Hey, say, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you. Give the Lord a praise right now. Praise him right now. Praise him right now. Praise him in your living room right now. Praise him in your kitchen right now. If you blessed to have a little extra office where you at, you praise him right now in that little office room right now. You might be driving on that smart road. You praise him right now. Coming to and from, help and say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. A couple more times, if you feel it, say, I love you. Lord, I love you. Food on the table, clothes on my back, roof over my head. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Hallelujah, God. Good morning, Faith Fellowship. This is Minister David Deleuze with your video announcements for Sunday, August 2nd. Church that prays together stays together. Please continue to pray at 6 a.m., 12 noon, 6 p.m., and midnight. Be sure to check the Faith Fellowship Live app for the latest information. Based on recent orders from the governor, the reopening for worship service has been delayed. We will update you as more information is made available. Many lives have changed during this pandemic. If you're in need of a helping hand, please contact the church office at 916-339-9156 or Sister Katie Terrell at 916-692-8403. All requests will be kept confidential. Please join the Faith Fellowship Bible Study classes on Tuesday evenings at 6.45 p.m. with Elder Dale Burney and Thursday mornings at 10.30 a.m. with Deacon Leon Archie. If you're not receiving the Bible study lessons, please provide your email address to the church office. Please call the conference call line and please remember to mute your phone. If you want to stay up on the latest information regarding the pandemic, Please make sure to check out the COVID-19 regulations from the California Department of Public Health and our very own Faith Fellowship guidelines, which have been posted to the church website and are available on the Faith Fellowship Live app. Please review the Faith Fellowship guidelines, which were previously mailed to you. The Fortune School of Education was established to close the African-American achievement gap by getting kids ready for college, starting in kindergarten, through a system of tuition-free public charter schools. For more information, please call 916-924-8633. Okay, saints, let's make sure to call in to the Faith Fellowship Hour of Power prayer line every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. The call-in number is 605-313-4118 and the access code is 126-049-POUND. A quick reminder, Faith Fellowship, all on-site church activities have been canceled until further notice. The ministry leaders will contact you for any Zoom or conference call meetings. Tithes and offerings can be paid through our giving app, Giblify, or you can mail your offering or drop it off at the church office on Tuesdays between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. until further notice. That concludes our video announcements. Now, let's get back to the worship service, embracing one church, one mind, and one Christ. Uh, good morning, Faith Fellowship. Uh, I'm Deacon Richard Terrell, and it's my privilege uh, to bring the morning prayer this morning. So if you bow your heads with me, we'll go to our Heavenly Father. Eternal God, we bow this morning, Lord, with joy in our hearts, Lord, for this another opportunity to worship together. 
We're not all in the same place, Lord, but we are all of the same spirit. And we thank you, Lord, for the spirit of unity that has pervaded faith fellowship even during these difficult times. Lord, we thank you for the saints of God who have kept in touch with one another through calls, through prayer, through Bible study, and through various Zoom meetings, Lord. We just continue to fellowship one another and thank you for your goodness and mercy. And so, Lord, as we come to you this Sunday morning, we pray, Lord, for those who may be having difficult times, Lord. We know this pandemic has uh, caused great difficulty, Lord, and great uh, transition on many, many families, Lord. But we pray you would just touch the families of God, that we would be faithful, trust, Lord, and believe in your word, that if we are faithful, Lord, you will provide, you will make a way. And so, Lord, we ask that morning as we worship together all over this county and all over this country that we would be inspired, Lord, and motivated, Lord, and, and lifted up by the word that comes forth, by the singing that comes forth, Lord, that all we say and do in the glory of thy holy name. You are a loving and a merciful God, and Lord, in spite of what we're going through, we know this too will one day end. And Lord, when it's over, we want to be able to give you glory, Lord. We want to be able to share with those who don't know you. Lord, there are many out there who are really going through despair because they don't have a Savior, Lord. And so let us be out. Let us be about our vision, Lord, of going and growing and sharing the word of God uh, throughout our communities, Lord. We share it on the airways. We share it virtually, Lord. And so let us just glorify you in all that we say and do. Lord, we thank you for faith fellowship and for the leadership of Pastor Rosalie Charty. What a wonderful woman of God, Lord, you've put in this place, Lord. And we have all been blessed, Lord, been nourished, Lord, through her preaching, through her teaching, just through her loving spirit. And so, Lord, continue to lift her up. Let us continue to support her in this ministry. And, Lord, we pray for the other ministers, the deacons, and all the leaders of Faith Fellowship, Lord, that we do not lose heart, but we keep faith during these difficult times. And, Lord, when you say it's right, we will all come back together under this one roof. But until that time, we're going to continue to faith, faithfully uh, worship, Lord. We're going to continue to contact one another, Lord. We're going to continue to pray for one another. We're going to continue to be the Christians you have called us to be in any circumstances, knowing, Lord, that we are the church. Let us be the church in these difficult times, Lord. And when times change, others will recognize, Lord, that we were faithful and steadfast during this pandemic. Guide us now, Lord, through this service. We ask your prayers upon the one that's gonna bring the message, Lord. We've been blessed each week by a very timely, inspiring, and practical message, Lord, and we're looking for the same this Sunday. So guide us, Lord, be with us. Keep us in your loving care this day and always. And in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Now, Faith Fellowship. It is time for communion. Aren't you excited? God allowed us to live here till August, and we're able to take communion together. Let us pray. The Bible tells us to examine ourselves. This is a good time. Not look at me. Look at yourself. Examine yourself. 1 John 1 and 9 says, if you confess your sins, he's just to forgive you. And guess what? He will take care of you. Let us pray. Father, we come to this table as your guests, resting only in the worthiness of your son. As we look upon the emblems of our Savior death, may we remember why he died, to cleanse and to heal, to satisfy your righteousness and justice. We remember his eternal love and boundless grace. May we receive the assurance of forgiveness, eternal life, and then the hope of glory. As the bread and the cup nourish our bodies, so may your indwelling Holy Spirit strengthen our soul until the day of Christ's appearing, when we will hunger and thirst no more and sit with him at his heavenly table. The Lord Jesus Get your elements ready, a cup, some bread, just something to show forth that what we are doing is symbolic of your communion. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, 
He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for us, let us eat together. In the same manner, he took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it and remem in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which we have been forgiven of our sins, let us drink together. Can we say hallelujah? Can we say thank you? Thank you for the communion. Thank you, Lord, for dying for us.
nobody but Jesus. Could ever make, could ever make such a sacrifice for me. It was the blood yeah, yeah, that made the difference. Faith Fellowship, would you please join me in a word of prayer? Our Father and our God, Lord, I thank you today for the awesome privilege to stand before your people and to minister your word. Lord God, my prayer today is that in spite of my human frailty and weakness, that you might demonstrate your divine power and strength. To the extent, Lord, that you would convince somebody, convict somebody, and convert somebody for your glory and for our good. Lord, when you have so done, it is my prayer that each and every one of us will give you all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise because you and you alone are deserving of the same. In Jesus' name, I pray. I'd like to say hello to Pastor Charlie, to my co-laborers in ministry, to my brothers and sisters in Christ, to our family and friends of Faith Fellowship Community Church. I greet you today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For those of you who have your Bibles, would you please open them to the Gospel of St. John, the ninth chapter. That's John chapter 9, 
And I'd like to read for your hearing verses 1 through 7. For your edification, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It states, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. My brothers and sisters, I'd like to use as a subject from which to preach today, a real eye opener, a real eye opener. Allow me to say by way of introduction that the story is told of comedian Bill Cosby staying in the same hotel as the legendary blind, blues, country, gospel, R&B, and soul singer Ray Charles. The story goes that Cosby decided to stop by Ray's room and say hello. He knocked and then entered as Ray yelled, come in. Cosby walked in the door and he heard Ray shaving with an electric razor. There were no lights on and the room was pitch black. Without thinking, Cosby blurted out, hey Ray, why are you shaving in the dark? Then Cosby remembered that Ray was blind and he thought, duh. Ray Charles good-naturedly replied, I do everything in the dark, brother. What is really eye-opening? Some of us relate to our unbelieving family and friends who are spiritually blind as though they can see, duh. We forget that everything that they do is also in the dark. The first point that I'd like to make today is the great need, the great need. This blind man is a microcosm of the spiritual condition of every man, woman, boy, and girl since the fall of Adam and Eve. The world is spiritually blind from birth. This blind man lacked the ability to see Jesus physically, just as unbelievers lack the ability to see Jesus spiritually. The Apostle Paul put it this way, but even if our gospel is veiled or hidden, it is veiled or hidden to those who are perishing whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the visible image of the invisible God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, lost people do not need just a little more information so that they can make a more informed decision to be saved. Rather, lost people need the miracle of spiritual sight that only God 
can give. The disciples viewed this blind man as an interesting theological case study. In John chapter 9, verse 2, they asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Since most blind people have an acute sense of hearing, it was cruel and insensitive for the disciples to ask such a question within earshot of this poor blind beggar. Behind their question was the commonly held Jewish view that there is always a direct correlation between sin and suffering. Some of you will recall that this was the view of Job's equally cruel and insensitive comforters. They reasoned that if Job was suffering, then there must have been some secret sin that Job was unwillingly, unwilling to openly confess. It is true that all suffering in the world can be traced back to Adam and Eve's original sin. There is also sometimes a direct correlation between sin and suffering. Yet the Bible is equally clear that often even the righteous suffer apart from and independent of any specific sin that we have committed. But disciples, they bought into this popular cause and effect view. So do some of us. Since this man was born blind, either he or his parents must have sinned resulting in this disability was their thinking. The reason that they believed that the man could have sinned, there are several possibilities. Based on the account of Jacob and Esau struggling in their mother's womb, some rabbis taught that babies could sin in the womb. Some Jews also believed erroneously that the soul pre-exists prior to birth. Others believed incorrectly in reincarnation or the transmigration of the soul, the view that we can come back in different lives. Tina Marie's popular song, Deja Vu, advocates the false notion that she has been here before. There was even speculation that Jesus himself was perhaps a reincarnation of John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or some other deceased Old Testament prophet. Jesus unequivocally refutes the notion that this man's blindness was the result of his own sin. However, the Bible does teach that children can suffer on account of their parents' sin. Exodus chapter 34, verse 7 states, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and children's children to the third and fourth generation. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 18 adds, you show loving kindness to thousands and repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. We see these truths manifested today in the lives of children born to drug addicted or AIDS infected mothers suffer a lifetime of physical and mental impairment. We also see children whose alcoholic fathers verbally, 
physically and or sexually abuse them, suffer a lifetime of emotional and psychological trauma. But in this case, Jesus states plainly that this blind man was not suffering because of his own sins, nor his parents' sin. Neither this man nor his parents' sin, rather God was going to do something that was really eye-opening in his life. The second point that I'd like to make is the great Savior. The great Savior. Human eyes are a pair of complex optical organs. When healthy, our eyes detect and convert light into electrochemical impulses, transmitting these signals to the brain, resulting in sight or vision. In the Greco-Roman world of the first century, blindness was far more common than it is today. Everybody knew somebody who could not see. Some were blind from birth, perhaps victims of neonatal conjunctivitis, contracted during vaginal delivery from exposure to infectious bacteria, such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, or herpes simplex virus from the birth canal. Sisters, if you are wondering why I mention this uncomfortable reality, then you might want to take notice to what I'm about to say. If your husband, boyfriend, or baby daddy has been bed hopping and body fluid swapping during your pregnancy, then it is not just a matter of disrespecting you he is also putting your unborn baby's health at risk. Now, brothers, for those of you who may feel that I just threw y'all under the bus, let me say on the record, I used to be that guy. So I ain't hating, I'm educating. I give God glory, honor, and praise for his grace. Other blind folks in the first century lost their sight through disease such as cataract, glaucoma, and retinopathy through injury or through advanced age, notwithstanding that Jesus could open the eyes of the blind. Yet this blind beggar did not take the initiative to cry out to Jesus for healing. In contrast to blind Bartimaeus who cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Rather, Jesus saw this blind beggar and looked upon him with compassion and tender mercy. Jesus specifically came from heaven to earth to give light to those who sit in darkness and the recovery of sight to the blind. Jesus boldly proclaimed, I am the light of the world. Think of how this man must have felt. He began his day just as he had begun every other day of his dark existence groping and groveling his way to the busy thoroughfare to beg for alms. Perhaps it was part of his appeal to garner sympathy. He had no cardboard sign, so maybe he called out, I was born blind, please help. But why did Jesus heal this blind man in this unusual way? by spitting and making mud, applying the mud to the man's eyes and telling him to go wash the mud off in the pool of Siloam. Why didn't Jesus just speak the word as he had done for blind Bartimaeus? 
The Apostle John does not tell us. So any attempt to explain it is mere speculation at best. However, among other things, the unique way that Jesus performed this miracle teaches us, among other things, that each individual is unique and therefore requires a unique individual approach in regards to how we deal with them spiritually. There is nothing wrong with using different means and different methods in presenting the gospel. The motto of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association has been since 1950, quote, we exist to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ by every effective means and to equip the church and others to do the same, unquote. Jesus did not limit or restrict himself to the same means or same methods for every individual that he encountered. While it can be helpful to memorize a basic presentation of the gospel, we must be flexible and ready to customize our presentation on the fly to address each individual that we encounter. John chapter 9 verse 14 says, Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. In so doing, Jesus deliberately violated several man-made additions to the law of Moses that the Jewish legal authorities gave equal credence. Making clay was a breach of a prohibition regarding kneading on the Sabbath. Placing the clay on his eyes violated a regulation which prohibited anointing on the Sabbath. Healing on the Sabbath was forbidden unless it was to save someone's life. Jesus made clay, anointed this man's eyes, and told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam on the Sabbath. He did so to deliberately poke his finger in the figurative eyes of the legalistic Pharisees and scribes. They cared more about keeping the commandments of men than they, than they did about this poor blind beggar gaining his sight. They got into a rather heated discussion with the man who had been blind about whether Jesus was sent from God or was a sinner because he broke their Sabbath day rules. As learned men and legal scholars of the Old Testament, they should have realized and recognized that opening the eyes of the blind was messianic activity. In the Torah, the poetry, and the prophets, or what you and I call the Old Testament, there are no stories, zero, of sight being restored to the blind. But there are numerous references that state only the Lord, the Son of David, the Messiah, could and would open the eyes of the blind. The 146th Psalm, verse 8 declares, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 18 states, in that day, the deaf shall hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5 says that God will save his people, and the prophet goes on to add, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. When John the Baptist was languishing in prison, he began to wonder, 
if my cousin, Jesus, is the Messiah, then why am I his messenger in this dungeon? So John the Baptist sent messengers to Jesus to ask, cuz, are you really the Messiah or should we look for someone else? Jesus answered, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Jesus was referencing Isaiah chapter 35, which he had fulfilled, was fulfilling, and would continue to fulfill. In Isaiah chapter 42, verses 6 and 7, God is speaking to his servant, the Messiah, and he says, I will give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes. It is interesting that of all the recorded miracles that Jesus performed, giving sight to the blind has more than any other category. The Jewish leaders who thought that they knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards, sideways and upside down, should have concluded that Jesus was the Messiah based on this criteria alone. The fact that they did not underscores the reality that it takes the great Savior to physically open blind eyes. But this great physical miracle points to the greater spiritual miracle. Jesus, the light of the world, is the exclusive, he is the only, the sole source of spiritual enlightenment, revelation, and understanding. Every other religion, philosophy, or belief system is spiritual darkness. Jesus opens spiritually blind eyes through the preaching, teaching, and witnessing of the gospel. When we get an opportunity to share the gospel with someone, we must keep the focus on Jesus. People will try to divert the conversation to all sorts of peripheral issues, such as evolution, or why does God allow suffering, injustice, police brutality, or disparate wealth. While we may need to respond briefly and succinctly to these issues, we must intentionally steer the conversation back to who Jesus is, what Jesus has done for us, and why he is willing to do the same for them. The third and final point that I'd like to talk about is the great purpose, the great purpose. In response to the disciples' theological question, Jesus answers and explains, neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. The primary aim, goal, and objective of the gospel is to display the glory of God. Some have a problem with this perspective or view that God would allow this man to be born blind and to suffer all of these years just so that his healing would display the works of God. However, I believe that such people have too big a view of man and too little a view of God. If our short-term suffering can bring glory to God, and display his infinite worth to others, then our suffering takes on long-term meaning and significance. The Apostle Paul put it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. He says, for our light affliction, 
which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Although the Apostle Paul qualifies the afflictions that we experience as light in reference to weight and momentary in reference to time, they are real afflictions just the same. Our affliction is light and momentary compared to what Jesus suffered for us. When we consider even a long life by this world's standards, 70, 80, 90 years is light and momentary on the scale of eternity. Jonathan Edwards argued that God created the world for his own glory. Since God is infinitely glorious, it would be inconsistent with his character not to seek his own glory. In other words, God does what he pleases and he is pleased with what he does. Edwards also argues that there is no disparity between God seeking his own glory and at the same time seeking our ultimate happiness. God may be glorified in us through physical healing as with the blind man or through our experiencing the sufficiency of God's grace through our affliction or suffering as was the case with the Apostle Paul's thorn in his flesh. The healing of the blind man depicts and symbolizes what happens whenever God saves a soul through the gospel. God gets the glory and we get a blessing. Our happiness in what God has done for us contributes to his glory. The gospel is not primarily about how Jesus can give us a happy life for our own sake. The gospel is about how Jesus can give us a happy life so that we can proclaim his excellence or glory as we tell others about God calling us out of darkness into his marvelous light. This blind man did that. He was obviously a changed man. In fact, some of his neighbors thought that he must be someone else who looked like the blind man. But he kept saying, I am he. Or ironically, can't you see? It's me. So they wanted to know how this miracle happened. He refers to Jesus as the man who is called Jesus. Keep in mind that he had still not yet seen Jesus and he did not know where Jesus went. But he told his neighbors what Jesus did and what Jesus told him to do. He also testified to the Pharisees and to the scribes his conviction that Jesus was a prophet. These religious leaders were not trying to hear that noise, so they disputed and attempted to impeach his testimony. He shook his head in amazement, and if I may paraphrase him, he said, you gentlemen are free to engage in your legal, philosophical, and theological arguments about whether this man called Jesus is sent for God or is a sinner all you like. But as for me, with apologies to the late great Sam Cooke, I don't know much about history. I don't know much biology. I don't know much about a science book. I don't know much about the French I took, but I do know that I was blind, but now I see. In closing, what is really eye-opening is this man's changed life and simple witness glorified God. It is my prayer, my brothers and sisters, 
that our changed lives and simple witness would do the same. God bless you. God keep you. Praise the Lord. I don't know about you. A real eye opener. Minister Bernie, I tell you, man, I'm going to take this home myself. I need two, two uh, uh, tapes for this. This is good. A real eye opener. We all need that. I don't know about you, but my heart is just filled today to hear a word like that. Now, right now, to those of you that are listening, you might not know it, but there was a time when I used to be blind. And guess what? His amazing grace woke me up, opened up my blind eyes. Today, you want your eyes open. You're walking around. You might think you could see. Why don't you just accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You got the word. All you need now is the faith. Romans 10 and 9 says, if you confess your sins to him, he will forgive you. That's all it is. That's the eye open. Just confess it. And if you believe that he lived and died for your sins, you can be saved. Then you come on over to Faith Fellowship. We'll teach you and you might grow, that you might continue to do the work of the Lord. So may God bless you. May God keep you. Heaven is shouting right now. God bless you. Now it's time for our benediction. This is the closing, and sometimes I don't like to close. I, I just like to continue on in the word. And I just want to say it to those that are listening, members of Faith Fellowship, get in touch with the church. Call us. Send your tithe and your offering through the mail. Let us know you still love God. Don't, let's not stay at home and get complacent. So right now, as we do the benediction, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all in spite of what's going on. Amen. I just want to let you know this is going to pass. He, he's going to take care of all of us. No fear. Let go and let God do what he's going to do. May God bless you. Until... Next Sunday, same time, same place.